Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris, for that very kind and very accurate, impressively accurate int introduction. Um, right, so what is EMI, other than being an acronym standing for English as a medium of instruction? And in particular, what is the relevance of EMI to EAP? That's what I'm going to focus on in my talk this morning, and I want to thank the organizing committee a lot for inviting me to give this opening plenary because it's really forced me to think about the practical and real world consequences of um, the research that I've been doing on EMI in European higher education in particular for the past eight years or so. So I look forward to sharing my um, thoughts with you on this today and even more to hear your thoughts on how you think the EMI and the EAP community can come together to a greater extent than they currently um, are. Okay, so my talk uh, is divided into four main parts. First, I'm going to talk, uh, give some background to EMI, what it is, where it happens and why. I'm then going to talk uh, in part two about what I think EAP can learn from EMI before I reverse the question and ask what EMI can learn from EAP and I'm going to finish off by pulling out a couple of conclusions. So EMI, what is it, where does it happen and why? This is one definition offered of EMI. It suggests that EMI is the use of the English language to teach academic subjects in countries or jurisdictions where the first language, the L1, of the majority of the population is not English. And this is a very good definition, probably the best one we've got at the moment, but when you start to think about this, it doesn't seem to capture all of the contexts where English is used as a medium of instruction. For instance, I would expect that a lot of you work in a context where you support um, international students coming to the UK to um, to um, to do their studies uh, if, if you're into the practitioner, practitioner aspects of EAP. Um, however, the definition would capture um, the, the, um, the situation where a Chinese student who had Chinese as a mother tongue or a native language or first language, whatever term you want to use, stayed in the in China and did um, uh, did their degree at a UK branch there, uh, say at the University of Liverpool or the Uni University of Nottingham. So there's a bit of um, issues around trying to define EMI in a in a in a comprehensive way without running into problems. In a further attempt to narrow down what we mean by EMI, which is really not that easy, as I'm trying to argue, uh, you can think of EMI on uh, a language content continuum, such as this one, which I borrowed from John Airy, who does research into EMI. Um, below the arrow here, you've got the type of course. You've got EAP, CLIL, which stands for Content and Language Integrated Learning, and EMI, English as a Medium of Instruction. And the learning outcomes of each of these types of courses differ. So in EAP, it's only language, and I realize this is probably a bit crude, okay, because there is tension in EAP, of course, between English for general academic purposes and English for specific academic purposes, but it might help to just schematize it sort of simplistically here, and then we can problematize it later. Um, the learning outcomes in an EMP, in, in in an EMI course is only focused on content, whereas in CLIL courses, the learning outcome comes are dual, so you are, you're both taught language and content. In EMI courses, um, language is just a tool for delivering the course content, which might be physics or medicine or linguistics or really any type of course. And in CLIL, this is a pedagogical approach in and of itself where there is a dual focus on learning language and learning content. 
Unlike EMI and EAP, where the E stands for English, CLIL doesn't actually specify that uh, the language to be taught is English, but it's usually the case that it is English. As a further attempt to try to narrow down what we mean by EMI, you can visualize it like this, um, where you folk, or where you can say that EAP, CLIL, and EMI focus on different geopolitical contexts and different educational levels. So in terms of the geopolitical context, EAP is typically used or um, in focus in an English dominant context. Uh, and I prefer the, to use the word English dominant rather than Anglophone because um, I mainly work in a Scandinavian context where the general population have quite high English language proficiency. So it doesn't really make sense to say that this context is non-Anglophone. Uh, however, it does make sense to say that it's non-English dominant. Um, the range in EAP courses is typically global. Uh, I would say, although it's focused on English dominant contexts, um, we've got EAP courses in the US, in the UK, in Australia. Uh, for CLIL courses, and EMI courses, they focus on non-English dominant contexts, CLIL courses mainly in Europe. EMI courses um, have a more global range, and uh, that will become clear what this means when we focus on the educational level, because of course, uh, EMI is used as a medium of, or English is used as a medium of instruction in a lot of um, former British colonies in Africa and Asia at primary and secondary level, as well as tertiary level, to varying degrees. EAP, of course, it's in the nature of the name, A, academic, that it's only concerned with tertiary level, whereas CLIL has mainly been concerned with, with the secondary level, but increasingly also some tertiary focus, recently especially. Uh, sometimes then the acronym is changed to specify this, and it's called ICLHE as one option, which stands for Integrating Content and Language in Higher Education. Okay, so on to where EMI is on the rise. Where does it happen? Well, it happens everywhere, really. Uh, and research is beginning to emerge from countries as varied as Japan, Vietnam, Indonesia, China, Thailand. Um, but it's probably true to say, um, and take this with a pinch of salt because there aren't any reliable, comparable numbers on this, but it's probably fair to say that uh, it has affected Europe um, most. 48% of international students um, have Europe, a country in Europe, uh, as their destination. Um, of course, a lot of them come to the UK, but they also increasingly come to other countries in Europe. And because of this, there's probably most work on EMI and its consequences that comes from Europe. And two key scholars in this area are Vector and Mayworm, who have tried to track the development of EMI across Europe. And they've made three different types of calculations, one in 2001, one in 2007, and one in 2014. <coughs> uh, the two latter here are the most comparable ones because they operationalize EMI in a similar way. And in 2002, they counted 2,389 programs, EMI programs, that were fully taught in English in uh, all non-English dominant <laughs> European higher, sorry, higher, higher education institutions in Europe. Uh, seven years later, in 2014, that has, this had risen to over 8,000, so it's a 239% increase. So it is a phenomenon that is in growth, and it, it is expected to continue to, to grow. Within Europe, uh, scholars are beginning to detect some variation as to where, what regions EMI spreads most in, um, and there's beginning talk of a north south divide with the Nordic and Baltic regions and Central West Europe uh, leading um, the provision of EMI and the rest of Europe lagging somewhat behind. 
This is measured on three indicators, both the proportion of higher education institutions that offer English taught programs, and the proportion of study programs that are fully provided in English, and the proportion of students that are enrolled in English taught programs in the academic year 2013 to 14. Presumably this has a little bit to do with the English language proficiency. Um, the European Commission's latest Eurobarometer study, which came out in 2012, tried to um, get an overview over English language proficiency in different European countries. And um, it showed that uh, in Denmark, for instance, which is obviously a country in Northern Europe, the average Dan Dan Danish person said that they, well, 86% of Danish people said that they were able to hold a conversation in English. And the, um, the same figure for Spain, a country in uh, Southern Europe, was 22%. So presumably the different levels, is, levels of English competency or proficiency have had something to do with English as a medium of instruction having um, reached Northern Europe to a greater extent. Another type of variation there are in EMI uh, is the disciplinary differences. Here you can see that social sciences, the business and law, uh, are the disciplines that use most EMI, followed by sciences and followed by engineering manufacturing and construction and then there's quite a gap till we've got the humanities and the arts again this is data from Vector and my worm um, and again I think it's important to take this with a pinch of, to uh, of salt because I have seen other research where um, other disciplines have shown more English uh, EMI than, than what is shown here and I think this has to do with how you group different disciplines together and if you count the faculties or the disciplines and so um, for instance, in, in, in the Scandinavian context where I've done most of my work, it's not usually the case that legal courses or law courses are taught uh, in English because it's such a cultural, uh, culturally bound subject that is based on the uh, Scandinavian legal system. So it would be quite unusual for, for that to be taught in, in English. But because it's grouped together here with business, which is Usually, most, most studies would actually um, highlight business studies as being one of the most that are most affected by EMI. Uh, it shows up here as, as, as quite a high EMI user. And the third main variation, type of variation that exists in EMI um, programs is probably between educational level. So unsurprisingly, perhaps, most EMI happens at bachelor level no, sorry, at master level, which is about 80% of uh, all EMI happens at master level and only 20% at um, bachelor level. So why does it happen? Um, this is one of the questions that I am most interested in exploring my research, actually. And what my research has shown so far is that it's worth making a distinction between uh, agency and structure here, which are obviously sociological terms that could be said to refer to uh, cases in which English is a deliberate choice. So it's to do with the agentic well, agency of different actors. They deliberately, rationally choose to implement EMI at their institution. And then we've got the structural factors that are cases where English or EMI sneaks in the back door. And it happens indirectly as a consequence of other, uh, other factors, political, economic, uh, other structural factors. So let's have a look at these, uh, some examples of these different types of uh, reasons. So as for the cases in which English is introduced as a consequence of a deliberate choice, uh, Victor and Mayworm sent out a questionnaire to those decision makers at institutions who decide to introduce EMI and the reasons they gave for doing it were that it sharpens the institution's <coughs> international profile, it abolishes the language obstacles uh, and allows the enrollment of foreign students. They also wanted to improve the international competences of domestic students 
and they wanted to compensate for the sh financial shortage, shortages of the institution. So uh, often it's the case that uh, international students pay higher tuition fees, and they wanted to to um, introduce EMI to to attract those students. Uh, another motive was brain gain. The institutions wanted to attract the brightest and best students and staff from overseas. Um, and some cited an altruistic motive. They wanted to do good by the world. As for the situations in which English sneaks in the back door and is more a cons <coughs> consequence of structural factors, um, I think most scholars would probably agree that uh, ne the neoliberalist ideology plays a huge role here. Um, in Europe, we've got the example of the Bologna Declaration, which was signed in 1999, and which sought to create a, a joint European area, the European Higher Education Area, EHEA, um, which sought to increase mobility within the EU in order to make the European Union much more competitive vis-à-vis -vis, uh, the United States. So they standardized the, the degree structure so it was easier to go to another country in Europe to study. Interestingly, there is not a single word in the Bologna Declaration that is devoted to linguistic issues. How are we actually going to accommodate this enhanced cultural and um, transnational mobility? Um, it was just assumed that that would sort itself out, but, but that is... Uh, a big reason why we now have so much EMI. And university ranking lists, the increased competition uh, and collaboration as well between institutions also indirectly engenders um, English as a medium of instruction. Uh, just to show you a quick example of this, um, this is some of my own research my work in progress, so it's still quite rudimentary. Um, but it does seem that there is a strong correlation between the extent to which a nation offers EMI in its higher education system and the extent to which those universities rank on international uh, ranking lists. So the picture on the left here shows the extent to which EMI is used, and the darker the color here, the more English is used. So you can see that the lead leading countries here are Finland and Sweden and Denmark and the Netherlands and Cyprus. And the picture on the right shows the combined rank of the universities in each of those nation states. Um, you might be able to detect with the eye that there is uh, um, a, a bit of a correlation. Uh, the, so the, the darker countries on the right-hand side are also the ones where the universities are higher ranked. And if you put this relationship to, this, to the statistical test, it does come out at, as strongly uh, positive and statistically significant. Okay, so on to part two now. What can EAP learn from EMI? This is something that I've been really trying to think about, um, and I think one of the key things that I thought was that uh, EMI has helped make visible uh, the language needs of a much wider range of stakeholders and a much wider range of type, range and types of activities um, than perhaps is on the radar of of, um, of 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 either field at the moment. So if you think of the activities that are undertaken and the skills that are needed in a higher education context, it might look something like this. Key activities undertaken are teaching, research, and administration, and the key skills that are needed are broadly writing, speaking, listening, and reading. And I hope it's fair to say that the EAP community uh, has so far focused particularly on the needs of the students. Um, in each of the four different skills to varying degrees. With the rise of EMI, there is a need, there is a, a need to focus on, a, on the language needs of a, of a wider range of stakeholders. 
So the teachers, for instance, the lecturers who deliver <coughs> lectures and classes uh, in EMI also have language needs. And here I'm going to report some research um, that has sh uh, suggested that um, giving a lecture in a language that is not your first is slightly more demanding than giving a lecture in a language that is your first. John Airy is a Swedish researcher, or rather a British um, researcher working in Sweden, and he uh, observed and interviewed 18 lecturers who work at a Swedish university. The lecturers took part in a course where they were asked to, uh, that, that, were, that was meant to train them to um, teach better or to deliver EMI teaching. Um, and as part of this course, they had to deliver a mini lecture, first in Swedish, and then a week later they had to give the same lecture but in English. And then he asked them about their experiences, what they thought about it, and he also observed them giving the lecture in these two different languages. What they said fell into nine different themes. They said that they had been asked to teach EMI at very short notice. They had received no training, presumably apart from the type of training, the, the course that they were participating in, in ARIES research. Uh, they all agreed that it required a lot more preparation to teach in English than in Swedish. They felt that they could talk with less detail and less flexibility uh, and less fluency when delivering in English. Um, they also were quite adamant that the, their job was not to correct the students' English. They didn't want to do any sort of correction. And on a more positive note, a lot of them felt that there were actually quite few differences between teaching in English and teaching in Swedish and that it gave a huge confidence boost to teach in English. Um, another interesting study was undertaken by Jensen et al. Uh, and he reports, or they, um, it's a joint study uh, with Jensen and some collaborators, they report on what students think of um, EMI lecturers. And this study was undertaken at the university, at, as, at the Copenhagen Business School in Denmark. And um, what he did was to send out a questionnaire to more than a thousand different students in this context, asking questions about the students' perceptions of their lecturer's English proficiency um, and he asked them to rate this on a Likert scale from I strongly agree to I strongly disagree um, with the following statements. I found the teacher's English fluent. I found that the teacher often struggled to find the appropriate words. I found that the teacher had too ma many long hesitations. I found that the teacher had good English grammar. I found that the teacher had, has good English pronunciation. I found that the teacher sounds like a native speaker of English. And he also, or they also asked the students uh, a lot of questions about their perceptions of the lecturer's subject competence. I found the teacher very knowledgeable about the subject. I found the teacher to be a real expert in this field. I found that the teacher was good at explaining the subject. I found the teacher engaging. Um, I found that the teacher kept my interest, was enthusiastic about the subject, and I found the teacher pleasant. What he found was, that there was a correlation between these two things, okay? So, the students' perceptions of their lecturer's English proficiency correlated strongly with their perceptions of the lecturer's competence in the subject they taught. So, in other words, um, if the teacher doesn't speak good English, whatever that me means, their uh, credibility in their subject uh, might be at stake. In the interest of reporting a sort of balanced picture here, it should be said that although this is a very reliable and convincing study, it's actually in the minority. And I think it's probably fair to say that most research in this area has said that language skills are not as important as pedagogical skills. Uh, so as long as the teacher is able to um, 
make a subject interesting and engage the student in what they're learning and making the course content relevant to them, then whatever type of English uh, they speak and how many errors they do make, it, it doesn't really matter. Okay, another group of stakeholders or group of people or however we want to refer to them that have also been, whose language needs have also been visibilized by EMI are the admin people. This is a group of people who are very often invisibilized in EMI research. There's hardly any research uh, about their language needs. But you might imagine uh, an admin person having to write uh, plagiarism letters to students uh, who might risk being expelled from university because of a plagiarism case. So this requires legal knowledge and interpersonal skills um, that, that, might not, um, that they might not have any sort of training in. Another thing that I thought about was how different it actually is um, to have, well, how different the academic language needs actually are whether you are a first language user or a non-first language user. So I think it is true that uh, or a lot of research has shown that, that students and lecturers are a bit wary and um, insecure about speaking in, in, uh, um, in English, in a language that is not their first, particularly when uh, the interaction in question requires them to think on their feet and, and interact spontaneously, as would be the expectation in a lot of seminars. Um, and that there, this seems to be quite a consistent research finding that there is insecuri insecurity among lecturers and students in this area. However, when we think about it, it might also be argued, and I want to throw this out to you as well to, as something to think about, because um, I'm not sure, <laughs> really, um, how different it actually is to use English as a first language and, and as, a, uh, as a language that is um, your second or your third or, 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 or fourth or whatever. And it could be argued, I guess, that a lot of the uh, needs, uh, academic language needs, equally, are equally strong uh, for someone who uses English as their first language. Listening to lectures, for instance, that requires uh, grappling with the academic content, which might be at a high, quite, high, um, quite a high level. You need to be able to take efficient notes, um, which is not something you're normally taught. Reading, uh, it might be useful to know the distinction between scanning and skimming and reading critically. That's certainly a skill that would be useful to learn whether you have English as a first or a second or a third or a fourth language. Um, doing research, writing, retrieving information from lots of different sources, the internet, that's also something that is needed whether you have English as a first or second language. So this might be overstating the point a little bit, but you could come to the conclusion that the language needs in an EAP, EAP context and an EMI context are actually quite similar. Okay, so part three then. What can EMI learn from EAP? I think, and there's been a lot of research quite recently that um, it seems to be quite important for EMI uh, to move in the direction of EAP. The EAP knowledge, as I see it, is extremely mature. Um, the EMI community would kill for knowing what you do. I mean, I remember I was part of a working group a couple of years back where we had to devise a document um, with tips on how to actually deliver EMI uh, courses successfully. And it didn't occur to us to look to EAP for, for advice there. You know, it's as if the two communities are working in different silos and don't interact with, with, with each other. Um, and it wasn't until I came to a UK context to work where I realized, oh, there's such a thing as EAP. Um, so you've got a really, really, you're miles ahead, years ahead of, of what EMI is here uh, um, in terms of the knowledge base. And it's practically oriented and it's research informed. So I think it's very, very strong. ARI sees three different options for integrating language and content. 
he suggests that one option is that language teachers could teach both content and language, but in a tertiary, tertiary context, he rules this out because um, content teachers are by nature experts in their subjects. So to ask or to expect a um, language teacher to, te to teach uh, mechanical engineering would be just as ludicrous as expecting um, a physicist to teach uh, systemic functional linguistics to, to, uh, to a language person or to a language student. Uh, a second option is that content teachers could teach language along with content. Um, the problem with this is that a lot of um, content teachers, specifically in the sciences, don't see it at all as their remit to teach language. And a third option is that language teachers and content teachers can cooperate. Uh, that's probably the best way forward. So how might such a collaboration look? Well, either e we can have EMI supported by EAP classes, which is probably what happens in some institutions in Europe at least, or a content, the content and the la language lecture could teach in the same classroom. I think there have been some experiments with this. I'm not sure how realistic it is. Um, and the content teacher could take responsibility for both the content and the language teacher, but they would then need a lot of help from EAP teachers and researchers. So one example, which I borrowed from Martin Del Pozo here, uh, is that she, sh she suggests that an EAP researcher could observe EMI classes and identify the academic speech and writing functions in a lecture or a class teaching or whatever and note down how this teacher actually do, does all these different things that they do in an EMI classroom. How do they explain? How do they state facts? How do they ask students to reflect? How do they compare and contrast and so on? Um, and they, they could then quantify these speech, speech functions, uh, identify how many occurrences there are and they could analyze them and then develop develop um, curriculum material on the basis of this. And this is just one example which comes from a, from a teaching context. If we go back to this screen here, focusing on the many different types of activities that are undertaken in a university context and the many different types of skills that are needed, um, this practice could be, I guess, applied to each and every one of this. So an EAP researcher could look at how an admin, the needs that an admin person has and, and uh, and um, uh, yeah, and engage with that. Okay, so to finish off by pulling out some conclusions, then um, it has sometimes been suggested that uh, with the growth of EMI, there will be a lot less for the EAP community to do because EMI is supposed to increase the English language um, skills of um, of EMI students. I don't think that's the case at all. It's quite the opposite. Uh, there will be a lot more for EAP to do. And I think EMI has helped visualize the language needs that exist in this context. And um, EAP has the knowledge base to ensure a successful implementation of EMI. There's a need for collaboration <laughs> between the subject and the language teachers between the EMI and the EAP community, between EAP decision makers, practitioners and researchers. And I think there might be a need to think outside of the box to identify those opportunities and to overcome institutional and disciplinary obstacles to such collaboration. But the opportunities and the needs are certainly there. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christina. That very nicely, I think, uh, sets the scene uh, for today's uh, proceedings. Uh, There's going to be lots of uh, food to thought for the rest of the day. Um, we've got uh, uh, a few minutes for questions, if anybody has any questions for Christina. Thank you. Two questions. Thanks very much. Firstly, are we going to get these slides? <laughs> <laughs> sure, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure they'll be waiting for you. Yeah. Yeah, everything will be made available via, 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 via. Thank you. And the other question was just about the 
finding me in my, um, I might be completely off the centre, but my sense is that EAP is something, is a subject which is taught, whereas EMI is a condition of learning. Mm. And I'm wondering whether those two things are comparable in that sense. Yeah. I do see what you mean, and I've been asking myself that same question. I think it's a very good question. Um, I, I also think that there is certainly something to suggest that EMI is, is a phenomenon, is not a course as such, whereas both EAP and CLIL, I would say, have a clear pedagogical rationale. And e EMI is in many ways just a phenomenon that happens. Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yes. I'd just like to ask a question. You make a distinction in your BMI between when it's happening in country with both lecturers and students in their first language environment, which is not English, such as is typical and has been going on for many years in some particular countries, and transnational dimension where you've got HEIs going out to um, those countries and actually couldn't interact in um, the home country language. Mm. Yeah, I think that you're very right to contrast those two examples there, there. And I think that there, even there, there's a little bit of a gap between the EMI community because I think it's probably fair to say that they focus mostly on the first um, scenario there where. Um, where students come to that institution rather than um, EMI taking place in Vietnam or something, and, um, or in a in a transnational uh, campus that's in China, um, and I think they've got very different um, issues probably and reasons for introducing EMI, um, and that's certainly also something where it would be beneficial to have much greater communication across the different researchers who work in these different contexts and what the issues are. Yeah. Yeah. There's a question. Uh, in your experience of the MI institutions, do they have people delivering the AP within those institutions? There is an increasing tendency to do so. Um, one example is the University of Copenhagen, where I worked before I came to the Open University. They're probably quite far ahead in that regard. Um, they offer EAP courses, although I'm not sure they will actually refer to them as EAP courses, but they, they do, uh, actually they've gone quite far because they require each lecturer who's asked to teach in English um, to be certified. So they offer a test, a, specific, a specially designed test uh, that tests their English language proficiency and um, if they pass this test, then they are qualified, officially qualified to teach in English. And they would provide the training uh, if it turned out that they didn't, that they weren't um, qualified. So what about for the students? Do they assess the students at all in terms of their English proficiency? Well, uh, it, they vary. Actually, in Scandinavian countries, it's not that common to do that. It's just assumed that their English language proficiency is sufficiently high, which might be wrong or might not be wrong, right, or might be wrong or right. Uh, I think other European countries probably do do that to a greater extent. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I looked uh, mostly about uh, supporting lecturers uh, with their uh, language skills and maybe the support and maybe their being able to support across the um, silos of the CCF. What kind of downloading and support from the teacher development in general? I mean, not just the AP support, but general stuff. Mm. As well as a kind of EAP, you know, language test, a kind of teaching motivation assessment, like a PD server, a PD dip, but uh, actually teaching skills. Yeah, that's a very, very good point, I think. And that would fit very well with, I think, the, the main point that has emerged from research, which has suggested that it's not actually so much definitely not only the language that is at stake here, but it's the pedagogy, and it might you might get a lot further by focusing on pedagogical strategies and if, yeah, and, and how to maybe adapt your pedagogy for use in, um, in an EMI context. Um, I've heard of some Spanish lecturers who talked about um, them 
altering their pedagogic strategy quite uh, radically when they were teaching in an EMI context. So they would use mobile phones and different types of technology, for instance, to ensure that the students participated successfully in the lecture because they were quite worried about speaking English you know, spontaneously. So they had to really think outside of the box to make sure that they participated in, in the classes. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Um, with the spring of the year morning, and the most um, important context, and uh, given the classical uh, subordinate role of the EAD on the side of the study teacher, uh, would you envisage that this is going to be like empowerment um, and incidents of the role of the EAD teachers to train and help and support these subject teachers? If it would be empowering for the EAP teacher to provide their expertise, well, I mean, you, you would probably be in a better position to answer that question than I would. Um, I would hope so. Yeah. Yeah. I I think you 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 yeah you are you are right. You are pointing to some institutional barriers there that do exist. I think and some tensions here that need to be overcome in some sort of way. And I'm not sure how that's going to work. But um, I think I mean there is a lot of work to do to convince uh, EMI teachers as well that that actually they it would be very beneficial if they could be supported in some way and and not only in terms of developing skills but also raising their awareness of how language uh, works um, yeah but you're right that there is there is work to do in that area i think mm. okay well it's time for our, uh, our first break now thank you very much uh, thank you <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.